Gather round, gather, gather round, gather round. It is Wednesday night in East Lansing. It is go time. It is game week. Michigan State football. Spartans going to be at Spartan Stadium. High noon kickoff Saturday. It's going to be on the Big Ten Network. My friend Lisa Byington doing the play-by-play. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll be there. A lot of you won't. We'll miss you, but one of these days we'll get you back in the stadium. Wherever you're watching tonight, whether you're watching live or you're watching the replay Somewhere around the world as a Michigan State fan, we are glad to have you. Let's get right to the questions. We got some questions here from uh, Michigan State fans from all over the country that have posted at the Underground Bunker message board. My name is Jim Comproni, publisher of SpartanMag.com. Gather in, file in, grab some refreshments. The, The Maggers have posted several questions over at the Underground Bunker message board. And I will be attempting to field those questions and answer them tonight. Let's get to question number one. We've got like 18 or 19 questions. Usually I won't be able to get to that many. Hoping to get through 10 or 12 tonight. We're glad that you're here. Question number one from MSU Polo out of Rockford, Michigan says, Question of the week. The one that all the Spartan Nation wants to know about. If you had to decide based on what you've heard and what you know, who takes the first snap at quarterback? Getting right to it for the Spartans. On Saturday against Rutgers, the Big Ten opener, the season opener, finally October 24th. It's going to be a lot of fun. So MSU Polo from Rockford, Michigan is asking me, I don't know if he's asking me for, he says, if I had to decide based on what I've heard. Now, is he asking me what my decision would be or my prediction about what I think it's going to be? Um, I'm not going to do a prediction. I'm not big on predictions. I'm more on expectations. I'm expecting it, like Mr. Bone Man just posted, I'm expecting it to be Rocky Lombardi. I'm thinking that the the junior from Clive, Iowa, will uh, get the start. Just based on a few things I've heard, nothing, I've not heard any, like, any, any big indications that he is the guy. I've just heard, I've heard that uh, as of about a week and a half ago, he was making fewer mistakes than the others. But nothing definitive, and they're keeping it quiet. They've been wanting to keep it quiet for a reason. So that's just kind of what I'm expecting, but I'm I'm certainly not sure. Now let, me, let me tilt something here a little bit. Got to get Lynn Shadnoy in there. All right, so if it were my decision, I don't really have a decision. I don't know. I've not seen enough practice. I don't know. Um, Rocky might be a little more settled, I'm guessing. You hear good things about Peyton Thorne in the past about his – moxie and so forth but in the last month or so Peyton Thorne is the quarterback I've heard the least about I've heard a lot about Theo Day's talent arm talent strength physical physical stature and his athleticism and have been hearing that Rocky Lombardi is improved hearing that Rocky Lombardi is making the fewest mistakes I don't know If Rocky Lombardi has the highest ceiling of potential of the three, he might have the lowest ceiling of potential of the three. He's also the most experienced. He's a good leader. So does he get the the initial start? Big opening decision by offensive coordinator Jay Johnson and quarterback Mel Tucker. The first of many massive decisions Mel Tucker will have to make during his tenure as Michigan State's head coach. Um... You know, some of the insiders I've kind of talked to a little bit, they've not eliminated Theo Day. But I suspect Theo Day is going to get his shot, at some sort of shot at some point this year because he's got a lot of talent. We've talked about it before. You know, sometimes with Theo Day, a little bit of fogginess there, trying to be nice. Um, you, You saw that in the mic'd up segment on Monday that Mel Tucker released when he said uh, something along the lines of... he It was part of his Motivation Monday, and he had a little snippet where Mel Tucker was talking to Theo Day as he came off the practice field. And he said, uh, you know, and he was emphatic about it, and he, he told Theo, he said, let me tell you about hand smackers. We don't smack our hands here after a dropped pass or a bad play. We just go to the next play. And Theo Day, you could see him like, okay. In other words, we can guess... That something just happened. Theo Day may have made a nice pass. Somebody dropped a pass. Sounds like Theo Day like smacked his hands like he was upset at the wide receiver. That's a no-no. 
apparently now with Mel Tucker. It's a very Saban-esque type of approach. I think it's a good one and a healthy one. You don't need your players on the field showing up their teammates, whether it's a quarterback mad at a receiver or a receiver eyeballing a quarterback about, I was open, why didn't you throw it to me? Or I was open, why'd you throw it so poorly? You don't need that on a football team. It looks bad amongst themselves, which eventually, ultimately, looks bad for the coaches. Because if it's happening, then if you're not coaching against it, then you're just letting it happen. That's what Nick Saban used to say. That's Mel Tucker right there coaching against it, making sure that does not make it to the practice field. I thought there was too much of that back in 2016, and that team was awful at Michigan State. And they had a little better talent than their 4-8 and eight record. But the, the Mel Tucker mic'd up segment, he said it was part of his Motivation Monday, and on the tweet he said, don't dwell on the past, focus on the future, hashtag process-driven. The process is what Nick Saban used to talk about, and Mel Tucker's talking about it much in the same way, that the process is a multi-year journey for players to achieve a level of accountability and a level of uh, effective play. Process-driven is what it said. Process-driven. In other words, I took that to mean it was something for Theo Day to look at and say, trust the process. But I think it's a positive for Theo Day because these coaches are not giving up on him. They see talent. I've heard they've been a little bit frustrated about the fogginess, but they're not just going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're going to keep working with him, working with him. And I don't know if Theo Day will ever come around, but the coaches surely are not giving up on him. And that that tweet was all about that. Now, that being said, he might march out there and be the starter. I don't know. It doesn't look like it based on what I've seen or based on what I've heard, and and that that tweet right there makes me think they're telling Theo Day to just keep working, your time will come. As George Perlis would say, work hard, keep your mouth shut, and good things will happen. I don't know. Theo Day's got talent. They're not giving up on him. The the player I've heard the, the, the least about is Peyton Thorne. You know, Tucker said a couple weeks ago on his radio show that he likes Peyton Thorne's mobility, playmaking ability. But I've not heard a lot about him. And that's the guy that I kind of projected last spring to be the guy to eventually win the job. But I'm not so sure about that now. MSU Polo says, and I've not heard anything bad about Peyton Thorne. Just a redshirt freshman, probably waiting for his opportunity. I'm kind of expecting Rocky Lombardi to get the first shot at it on Saturday. I could be wrong. MSU Polo asks for a less obvious question. How do you think the pecking order shakes out at the running back position behind Elijah Collins? There's a lot of talk about Connor Hayward, maybe the first backup to get the carries, although Anthony Williams Jr. is probably the guy I most want to see more of. That's MSU Polo speaking. Um, My guess is that Anthony Williams will be the number two guy. I think that he showed some good ability at the end of the season last year in the bowl game. He certainly impressed last year's coaches in practice, and we didn't see a lot of a lot of what impressed them until late in the season. And then some of these other coaches like Jay Johnson and I think William Piegler have come out and echoed some of those sentiments about just being impressed with Anthony Williams as an athlete. He's had a year under his belt, played as a true freshman. I'm just expecting Anthony Williams to be the number two guy. Would not shock me if Connor Hayward gets the ball, gets a shot, because He's impressive in his own way. He's improved his body. He's he's versatile. He uh, has good hands. But what he needs to show is that he's got those running back instincts, the ability to take the ball, take the play where it's blocked, have some vision, things that he struggled at in his first two years as an every down running back. Of course, he only played four games last year. My guest, Anthony Williams, Although, you know, you're hearing good things about Jordan Simmons as a true freshman and Brandon Wright, be intrigued to see what he looks like at 241 pounds. I'm going to say Anthony Williams. Question number two, that was MSU Polo cheating with two questions. Spartan Green following the rules. He's got one question. He's from parts unknown, though, so he's not following the rules on telling us where he's from. So Spartan Green, I think your name's Spartan Green 123. You got to tell us where you're from. I'll, I'll entertain your question anyway. This time. But watch yourself. Spartan Green says, Will MSU go with a 4-3 or a 4-2-5 given the lack of depth at linebacker? Will Michigan State go with a 4-3 or a 
four two five given the lack of depth at linebacker. In the meantime, we invite invite you guys to ask some questions in the live chat area, and we will try to field those questions as long as my voice holds out. It's not my strength. I don't have many strengths, as a matter of fact. And someday soon we'll get you guys back in here making phone calls to take a little bit of heat off of me so you guys can talk and I can shut up for a little bit. So, Spartan Green's asking, will Michigan State go with a 4-2-5 given the lack of linebacker depth? If they go 4-2-5, it won't be due to line, lack of linebacker depth. Usually if coaches... James Bannon coming on strong with a... with a U.S. grant. With a U.S. grant. With $50. I don't have my bell. But I've got myself a ginger pumpkin pie candle. Doesn't really ring. It smells pretty good. It smells like autumn. Thank you, man. Appreciate that big time. Appreciate the heck out of that. My bell's over there. I gotta make sure I get a bell for next week. I always forget it. And if um you know, there's a lot of replica trophies on the market. I want to get my hands on some of those. I want to get my hands on the old brass spittoon and some of those other trophies. And I wish there was a uh, a replica of the Liberty Bell trophy because it's the one of the most handsome trophies in American sports. But Michigan State had a shot at it in 1993, lost to Louisville, so I don't think I'll get one, even if there were one avail- available. And even if there were one, it probably wouldn't ring like a bell. So anyway, Bannon, I'd ring the bell for the personal sponsorship you're providing here tonight. Uh, really appreciate that. Appreciate all the sponsorships we've gotten here at SpartanMag.com, the Spartan Mag Live show over the years. We really do. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. So and if you've got a question to go with it, i got to check to see if you had a question. I don't think he did. But the way it usually works, if you've got a question to go with it, your question cuts right to the top. Let me click, click on it here to see. No question with James Bannon. He's just throwing out a grant. I appreciate that. I really do. All right. So, yeah, Mr. Bowman says I've not had the bell in a long time. I'm on notice. Thanks a lot. The bell, truth be known, was a lamp. And I moved the lamp over there. I was hitting it. It's got dents in it from ringing it. So it's not really a bell. I was ringing a lamp. Now the lamp's just it's out of reach. Anyway, um, Bannon left a question of the bunker. I think I'm going to get to it here in a minute. All right, getting back to Spartan Green's question. Well, I better better go to Bannon's question. Let's put Spartan Green on hold for a minute because Bannon's pretty serious here. And I need to, uh, yeah, Jay Bannon from Sterling Heights. He says, how will the tight end spot eventually work out? We do not have a lot of depth at tight end. I've heard Coach Jay Johnson saying it was an important part of the offense. It must get better. You're right, it must get better. They've not recruited real well there. They've not developed players there real well. That's why someone like Matt Siebert, or is it Seibert? Siebert. I got that wrong for half the season last year, and now I've already forgotten again. Matthew Seibert from Traverse City. Transferred from Buffalo as a non-scholarship guy, was able to come in right away and uh, become, what, the number three leading receiver on the team last year with, like, something like, what, 29 catches? Sorry, I'm moving this camera around. See, when I come in here late, I don't get all my stuff straightened out. A lot of times when I'm late, it's because I'm doing things like camera and lights and things that shouldn't take as much time as they should. Camera, I've got the camera kind of like, the. it ends up with a tilt here, like where the Joker or the Penguin used to hang out in those old Batman episodes. Anyway, tight end. You know, Matt Dotson was a four-star recruit coming out of Ohio, had a lot of talent, was more of a wide receiver at Cincinnati Moeller, but had a tight end's frame to build on, tried to add some strength, added some for last year. Now he's taking some of that weight off. But Matt Dotson, in eight games last year, had 16 receptions. He's had some moments that have looked positive, but was injured last year in Achilles tendon injury. And listening to Jay Johnson, the offensive coordinator, and also the tight ends coach, Ted Gilmore, both of them have said in the last three weeks that Dotson is still coming back from that injury. I mean, it's been 10 months. I would have expected him to be further along than just coming back from that injury. Maybe that's what they want Rutgers to know or think. Maybe Dotson's been great and they're sandbagging. 
I don't know. We'll begin to find out on Saturday. But I'll take it at face value. They both said that he's still coming back from the injury. You know, it, someone mentioned to me that you have to realize that these guys were undergoing, some of these guys were undergoing re injury rehabilitation. And then in March, they were all sent home. So some of the physical rehabilitation they were getting from Michigan State staff was short-circuited. Did that have an impact on Dotson? It's a fair question. I don't know the answer. You know, we can ask questions like that to football coaches, but they're really secretive about things because they're looking for to protect any possible edge they could have in a game on Saturday. But Dotson, if you take it at face value that he's still coming back and not all the way back, you know, you've got Adam Burgos there, 260 pounds, true sophomore. Last year, got on the, last year he got on the field at the end of the year. Probably their more, most physical blocker. Can he develop into a pass-catching threat? Probably so as a, as a possession type of guy, but I don't see Burgos being a guy that can threaten a seam and go deep like Matt Dotson. Um, Tyler Hunt, the former punter. Hearing good things from coaches about him. Underrated athleticism. Surprised to them with what he's done. But he's still 6'2", 235. Still not the biggest guy. Nice player. Glad that he's in the program if you're a Michigan State fan. So what am I expecting? I'm kind of expecting Burghorst and Hunt. Maybe Dotson. You know, Trenton Gillison is in there. I mean, he'll, be, he'll get on the field. They, they'll need something from him. He still has to prove he can block. And I'm sure there's a lot of pressure on him to show that he can block because they've been waiting. The previous staff was waiting. The new staff saw the film. The guy's got to block better. He had a nice play in the bowl game. So I guess I'll amend that. I'm expecting Burghorst and Gillison, I guess, with Hunt knocking on the door, taking the Dotson thing at face value. You know, Max Rosenthal's up 20 pounds to 270, former fullback. And uh, we have not heard a thing about Parks Gissinger, former defensive end. He was hurried into duty for the bowl game after Rosenthal was injured, Dotson was injured, and I think there was one other injury. Gillison played, had a fumble, had a nice play, but then had a fumble in the red zone. So, you know, talking to Ted Gilmore, the tight ends coach, last week, he mentioned Tommy Guajardo and said he hopes they don't have to use Guajardo. I thought Guajardo had a very good chance to become a true freshman to play this year because of Michigan State's problems at tight end. I thought he looked athletic in his film, needed to add some mass, but according to Ted Gilmore, they're hoping they don't have to use him. Think about that, hoping they don't have to use him. I mean, if you use him, it's not like you're losing anything because everybody gets a red shirt this year no matter how many games you play. So if you're hoping you don't, don't have to use him, it's not a real good commentary on him. So we'll have to wait and see what that all means. Gillison, Burgos, Dotson, Hunt, maybe. I don't know. But any way you crack it, any way you slice it, I'm not expecting it, obviously, to be a team strength. Will it be a weakness? Um, at this point, there's not much evidence that it'll be a strength, that's for sure. We'll begin knowing more on Saturday. Back to Spartan Green's question about the 4-2-5. If they use a 4-2-5, it won't be to, due to lack of depth at tight end. I'm sorry, due to lack of depth at linebacker. When a defense runs a system, especially a first-year system, where they've got a honeymoon period and no pressure on them, they're going to run their system. They're not going to change to a 4-3 or a 3-4 based on personnel, I don't think. Anyway, if they run a 4-2-5, it's because Hazleton believes in a 4-2-5, and they played a 4-2-5 last year at Kansas State. Now, I, from what I'm hearing, yeah, they've been working on 4-2-5. But last year they had a 4-2-5. It was their nickel defense. Trey Person played in the slot area in the nickel defense. It's a 4-2-5. In the NFL, you see 4-2-5 as a base defense for a lot of teams. In college, you see it frequently, especially with some of the light heavyweight and middleweight programs like Michigan State. You don't see the 4-2-5 as much with the juggernaut programs like Alabama, Georgia, Clemson because they can stick with 4-3 personnel and one of the three is big enough and also 
quick enough to play in the slot, but big enough to play in the box. A, hybrid, a true hybrid guy that can do it all. Alabama has more guys that can do it all. Clemson has guys that can do it all. So you can look at the X's and O's of some of the major heavyweights, the national powers, but seeing what they do with their apples might not be what you can do with your oranges. Okay? So Michigan State had a good defense last year in a lot of ways. I think they're ranked number 19 in the country in total defense, but that's not quite Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State. Ohio State went with a 4-3, three linebackers, and they kept seven in the box to stop the run against regular personnel. They'd keep seven in the box against three receiver personnel, completely stop the run. Meanwhile, they knew if you tried to throw it, you, they, you had to block pass protect against Chase Young. With Chase Young out there, you normally had to leave in a running back to pass protect against him, if not two people to help pass protect against him, a tight end and a running back. And if you leave somebody in to help protect against Chase Young, now instead of five receivers out there, you've got four. So you've hurt your receivers and you've helped the coverage. Ohio State had three very good corners, including Okuda, Jim Thorpe winner, first-round draft choice. Ohio State, interestingly, went with three corners and one safety in the defensive backfield. They didn't go with two safeties. They went with three corners, and one of the corners would play in the slot where if you're a 4-2-5, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the area in question. In the slot area, the slot linebacker, the slot receiver, the space linebacker, as Mike Tressel called it this week, who do you put on that slot area? Do you walk a linebacker out there and give up speed but remain stronger against the run? Or do you put a safety in there and have a little more quickness and be softer against the run? Ohio State's like, we don't care. We're putting a corner there. We're going to cover them, lock them up man-to-man. We're going to keep seven in the box. You're not going to run. Go ahead and try to pass. You better keep someone in to help pass protect against number two, Chase Young. If you leave someone in to help with Chase Young, you're sending four out. and We'll cover your four with our four. Three corners and a safety. Um, with the safety over the top and... And uh, Ohio State was pretty good, but they've got different apples, right? But Ohio State didn't have to run a, a 4-2-5. Michigan State, will they have to? Um, you know, I think hey, they're going to have it in the package. Is it their base? That's the big question. Or is it a third down thing? Or is it something that they play against some teams that will be throwing it a lot, like a Northwestern, but not against a team that might be more run-oriented, like Iowa? I suspect, uh, you know, I'm hearing they'll have some 4-2-5 and some 4-3. They're not abandoning the 4-3. So that's still going to be at their disposal. So, you know, versus Rutgers, Rutgers runs. You know, they brought in Sean Gleason, offensive line coach. Terrence Gibson, thanks, Terrence Gibson. And he's got a question here. Terrence Gibson with a nice sponsorship. Really appreciate that, Terrence. Really do. Thanks a lot. Thanks for supporting Spartan Magazine, SpartanMag.com. Terrence Gibson says, Hey, comp, Terrence from Oklahoma City. Which assistant coach, offense or defense, do you foresee leaving Michigan State for another opportunity first? My guess is HB or Trestle could get tapped by a program soon. I think you're right about Trestle. Not so sure about Barnett. Barnett uh, chased that opportunity at Florida State. Uh, They had a great contract there. Made a lot of money. He's got a handsome bank account. Now he's back and he's Lansing. What is Harlan? Probably 52, 53 years old. You know, yeah, I mean, being a, being a coordinator, um, it's a million-dollar job. And as long as Hazleton's here, would Barnett want to stay as a corners coach, DB's coach? It's a good question. How long will Hazleton stay here? Will he become, if Michigan State has some success, will he become attractive? Maybe out in the mountain region or in the plains. He had a lot of success at Wyoming as a coordinator for a short time. I'm, I'm putting the cart way ahead of the bus right now, way ahead of the horses. I think Tressel might be hard to hold on to. He's got a great resume as a former defensive coordinator. You know, they're paying coordinators $1.5 million in, or more in the SEC. Would an SEC program come after him? I suspect so. Would Michigan State be able to pay a safeties coach over a million dollars? Probably not. Is Michigan State fortunate to have Mike Tressel as a safeties coach right now? Yes, because at the time Michigan State changed coaches, there weren't many coaching 
vacancies or job slots around the country. So Tressel stays, but I suspect that his earning potential is going to be pretty strong out there on the open market. So you're asked who's most likely to leave. I'm thinking Tressel. I think Barnett is a very valuable member of the staff. Might have less incentive to leave right now because he's already done it once. I think he loves East Lansing. I think he loves working with Mel Tucker. And I could see Tucker, like I said, I could see Barnett becoming coordinator here at some point. I think Hazleton's going to do real well. But like I said, I think Hazleton might have some opportunities. So if, if Barnett were to leave, would he leave to become a coordinator at another school for a million dollars like he did at Florida State last year? It's possible. I have not seen the contracts. I don't know how well he's compensated this year, but Florida State's still paying him, I think. At least some of it. I think those were some of the things they had to work out while they were while they were pursuing Harlan Barnett. And if you noticed, officially Harlan Barnett is listed as co-defensive coordinator. You now Hazleton's a um, very good coach, but also open-minded and approachable. He's listening to Tressel and Barnett and Burton and Tucker and everybody. It's not his way or the highway. So he's listening to these guys. So Barnett has a lot of say, of course but he's not co-defensive coordinator from my understanding. He's co-defensive coordinator due to the contract language of Florida State. In order to leave and remain compensated, lateral movement, lateral move, still a coordinator per se, one of those type of things. So anyway, let's get back to the questions. But first, I'm going to send out a tweet to let people know that we got a party going on here and we're going to invite some of them. Not all of them, but some of them. And there goes the tweet. All right. So when you talk about going against Rutgers, Rutgers with Gleason as offensive coordinator. Gleason was offensive coordinator for one year at Oklahoma State for Gundy. And Oklahoma State was one of the more um, pass-happy type of spreads in recent years. But last year at Oklahoma State, Gleason's offense was very much... Um, 50-50 in terms of run and pass, like right down the middle. I think 2,900 yards rushing, 2,900 yards receiving. I've heard that his offense will probably be a little bit more like what he did at Princeton. He's a coordinator at Princeton, did some good things there, and I don't know if he went somewhere else from Princeton to somewhere else than Oklahoma State. Not sure, but he's a New Jersey native back at New Jersey at Rutgers, and a good young coach. Shiano hired him, made him the most well-paid, the highest-paid assistant coach in program history. So, on one hand, you've got the Oklahoma State influence, Big 12 style of offense. Hazleton coached against them last year. So, I'll have to go look that one up to see how that one went down. I'm guessing if if you've got both at your disposal, a 4-2-5 and a 4-3, I'm just guessing that a 4-2-5 would be more likely for openers against Rutgers. I've heard that's a possibility. It's kind of what I'm expecting, but I'm not predicting it. Wouldn't be shocked if they come out old school 4-3. Um, question is, again, who's in that slot area on defense for Michigan State? And I think we'll get into that a little bit later because one of the questions pertains to that. Actually, this is the question that pertains to that. So I'll just keep rolling with it. All right, here's the question. If you're running a 4-3, your three linebackers are going to be Antoine Simmons and Noah Harvey on the inside. And, of course, Antoine Simmons is up, what, about 10 pounds from 215 to 225. And he said yesterday during during a Zoom interview that he saw last year when he played the Mike linebacker position after Joe Bocci became ineligible. He played. He started at Mike linebacker for two games. He said, I learned I need to have more weight to play inside like that. They moved him back out there to the slot for the last two games of the season. D'Antonio said they wanted to have more speed on the field, more speed at that position, so they moved Simmons over to the slot area, moved Tyreek Thompson to the middle, and Noah Harvey to the Sam. Anyway, and prior to that, I think Harvey was out at the, at the slot. Now Harvey's put on, what, 15 pounds? He's up to 240. So, you know, Simmons said he learned he needed to put weight on to play inside. 
which sounded to me like he's playing inside, unless that's just a, a head fake to all of us and to Rutgers, and he's going to end up back in the slot. And I asked Mike Tressel about it last week. I said, which, you know, what kind of players do you have to play in that slot area? And he mentioned some of the safeties and linebackers, you know, and said Michael Dowell probably would have been playing that position if they were running their old, the, the star position, if they were running their old defense. And he said, by the way, Antoine Simmons did a really good job out of the slot last year, which I think was just a head fake, meaning, yeah, Antoine Simmons played a lot of slot last year, or space linebacker, as Trestle called it, the star position, as it's been called for years. But I think Trestle just threw that out there as a smoke screen. I think it's pretty clear, I'm guessing, with Simmons putting on 10 pounds and the things that Simmons said yesterday about needing to play 10 pounds to play inside, I'm guessing Simmons plays inside. Question is, does Simmons play inside of the Mike linebacker and make the calls, or is he the Sam a little bit more of an outside linebacker position, which would put Harvey in the middle? If Harvey's in the middle, you know, he'd have to make the calls, and I heard that Harvey needs needs some work with that. But I think Harvey and Simmons are the on the inside. So who's in the slot area? Uh, if it's linebackers for the old system, it would have been Chase Klein. Well, it would have been Simmons with maybe Harvey in the middle and Chase Klein and Sam. Or Simmons in the middle with just Lord Botang in the slot. But And it was kind of looking that way at the end of last year. But I don't think it's, it's going to go that way. I don't think it's going to be a linebacker in the slot. They will have that linebacker in the slot against some opponents like Iowa. And... It'll be interesting to see what what it is when we when we get to that point. I think that's week three because it's not it's not going to be Noah Harvey. He's put on a lot of weight. Simmons can he still play it at ten pounds heavier? Simmons said that he's quicker and faster and bigger. All three hard to do, but he says that he is. And we those quotes from Antoine Simmons. You can read that story. We've got uh, over at SpartanMag.com an article I worked on last night, a sixteen hundred word article with the headline. It's about to get real is the headline, and we hope that you got something out of that and enjoyed that if you're a Spartan Mag subscriber. Those of you that are joining around the country that are Michigan State fans that are not SpartanMag.com subscribers, get with the program. Become a Spartan Mag subscriber. By the way, we've got a super-duper deal right now. Go to SpartanMag.com. It's a flash sale, and it's going to ex- expire at midnight tonight on October 21st. So you've got another three hours to go over there, and you can get SpartanMag.com access for a full year. For only 12 American dollars. That's a dollar per month for those of you um, that uh, are not real strong at math. So one dollar a month, twelve dollars a year. That's probably about 15, that's probably about 21 Canadian dollars, which we don't accept. But check it out, SpartanMag.com. You need a new habit here late in 2020. Become addicted to SpartanMag.com. It'll change your life for the better, maybe. Give it a shot. We'd love to have you as a SpartanMag.com subscriber. Go on over there to SpartanMag.com and become a magger. Get addicted to it. You'll be checking the Underground Bunker message board more than you'd like to admit if you're like most of us. So, um, anyway, that story we had that I wrote last night, about 1,600 words, and there's some other, other, another story I want to put together tonight, hoping I've got enough um, energy to get to it. I expect I will. But anyway, some of the questions that Antoine Simmons was, some of the quotes that I've, I've mentioned that Antoine Simmons said about being bigger and faster, bigger and faster, those quotes appear in that story as we talk about Michigan State. Preparation, counting down the days toward kicking off the 2020 season, finally. So, if you go with a 4-2-5 instead of a 4-3, all right, you're going to have, I'm guessing, Simmons and Harvey is the inside, inside at linebacker. So, who's going to be in that slot area? For Kansas State, it was a safety who weighed about 6'1", 197. It, it lines up. It looks like a linebacker. He doesn't physically look like a linebacker, but he plays in a linebacker area. Michigan State did that last year in the nickel defense. It was Trey Person as a safety they put in that slot area. But if that's your base, if that's your first and 10 defense against three wide receiver personnel against Rutgers, and you want to go with a 4-2-5, who are the candidates for Michigan State? I asked Tressel about that a little bit, and he mentioned Michael Dowell. You know, he kind of pump faked about, he kind of evaded whether or not they're going to use it 
full time. He didn't really evade it, but he just said for that for that look, these are some of the people. Because nobody's going to deny that you are at least going to have that type of lineup in a passing situation. Michigan State's had that over the years, like 30% of the time in passing situations. Nickel defense. Well, Michael Dowell, redshirt sophomore, last year played in the dime defense, six defensive backs. Got a decent amount of playing time. Michael Dowell is 6'1", 215. I mean, that's linebacker size in the Big 12. He's been on the field. He's got experience. I wouldn't be stunned to see Michael Dowell out there starting in a 4-2-5. Dominique Long is a candidate at 6'2", 195. A guy that has bounced around at corner and safety and back to corner, back to safety. And he's still repping at both. Mechanical engineering major candidate for the Campbell Award, which is the academic Heisman. Really a uh, an impressive freakazoid unicorn student athlete. Um, but he needs to he needs to still harness what he needs to do mentally on the football field. Good in special teams. Dominic Long led Michigan State in special teams tackles last year. 62 195's got some size. Could he play in that slot area? Could he play at safety? Could he play at corner? I guarantee you they've tried him at all of those. Tate Halleck is an interesting one. 6'4", 195. Yesterday, Matt Allen told us, I asked Matt Allen, who are some young players that we've not seen a lot of yet that you've been impressed with that we should keep an eye out for? And he mentioned Tate Halleck. Tressel did not mention Tate Halleck. He mentioned Dowell. He mentioned Emmanuel Flowers, who I don't really expect to be out there a lot. If I'm wrong, I'll be wrong. But And I hope he does. I hope he does prove me wrong. But Tressel will give you some head fakes on things once in a while. He did not mention, Tressel did not mention Tate Halleck. So as a follow-up question, I said, is, Tra- is Tate Halleck still with your group? And he said, yeah, that's why I don't like mentioning any, pl- any players because I forget some. But yeah, Tate Halleck, who's doing a good job. And the quote was, he, I think his quote was that he guarantees Tate Halleck will have a role. Tate Halleck played on special teams a little bit last year as a true freshman, played four games and then shut it down. Don Ramiro, thanks a lot to the Brez Prez. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Glad to have you back in action. Don Ramiro with uh, a tip. Appreciate the personal sponsorship from the Brez Prez. Good friend of mine going back a number of years. Lost track of him for a long time. And uh, the Brez Prez fought off the ropes real good. Proud of him. Looking forward to seeing him back again East Lansing someday soon. And appreciate this personal sponsorship tonight from Don Ramiro of the Brez Prez. And anyway, uh, so Tate Halleck. Played four games and then um, sat out to preserve redshirt status. He's grown about an inch, I think, since he enrolled here. Ron Armstrong, good friend of ours and contributor at SpartanMag.com, known as Big Mooby, former scholarship defensive back from the old Perlis era, um, coming out of Jackson, Michigan. Sustained a couple injuries as a player. Had to take a medical, but loves those Spartan dogs, and I enjoy talking with him. Ron Armstrong told me last year when he went to a couple practices that he was impressed with Tate Halleck and Chase Klein, and uh, I didn't forget that. Tate Halleck is a guy that's got got a high ceiling. of uh, He's got a ceiling of potential to make progress toward, and I think he's got a frame that, and a skill set that could be that could fit well in that space linebacker area at some point in his career. Still just a redshirt freshman. So you're looking at some of those candidates if they use a defensive back. Dowell, Dominic Long, Tate Halleck. Could they put a corner in there? In the nickel defense last year, they used Trey Person. In some, you know, in past years, they might use a corner in there if he's good and stout against the run. Scotty Hazelton, Hazelton, the defensive coordinator, said a month ago that they were looking at Trey Person to see what he can do down near the box, which I thought was uh, a tip that Trey Person was auditioning. Maybe in the box, in the dime, but dime is usually like third and 10, third and 12. You know, would he be an every down candidate 
for a 425 Trey Person. Trey Person's about 5'10, 175. But Trey Person, I've said for a number of years, is pound for pound the hardest hitter on the team. We've not seen this team in 10 months, but I suspect he's still a pretty good hitter. Good enough hitter to play there, down in and down out? Maybe not. But he played there in the nickel defense last year. Call me Kirk. Coming in strong with a sponsorship and a question. Press appreciate Call Me Kirk. I don't remember Call Me Kirk uh, posting here in the past. So I've got to take another look at this to make sure that there's nothing um, n- n- nothing, uh, you know, a little off color. Because sometimes if we don't know all the people in here, we don't know what they're gonna post because we know that there's some rascals out there. But not Call Me Kirk. He's not a rascal, rascal. Really good sponsorship. Really appreciate that, Call Me Kirk. Appreciate the help. Appreciate the sponsorship here at uh, Spartan Mag Live on a Wednesday night in East Lansing. And he says, any truth to the rumors I'm hearing that Rocky has become a completely different quarterback, as in much better than he's been in the past, or is that just fluff? I've not heard that rumor. Earlier today, or earlier in this episode, and earlier in this edition of Spartan Mag Live, I mentioned that I've heard that Rocky Lombardi has improved, as you would expect. Detroit Spartan is saying no, comma, fluff. Okay. So he's saying it's just fluff. And Detroit Spartan is well-versed on this information, too. We appreciate him as an astute observer and source. If if Detroit Spartan posts something here in the chat area today, take it at face value. He's a a valuable member of the SpartanMag.com community. So uh, I would agree with what he said based on what I've heard. It's fluff to say that he's a completely different quarterback. I don't think it's a completely different quarterback. I'm hearing he's improved, as you would expect for a redshirt junior, and he needs to improve. Um, Showing some leadership. Players respond to him, which is important. And as I said earlier in the the broadcast tonight, um, that that, uh, he's making... He, he was making the fewest mistakes of, of the quarterbacks, of the candidates. That was as of seven or eight days ago. Was that still the case wrapping up last week? I don't know why it wouldn't be, but it's, it's a close race. And But to answer your question, to answer your question, I don't, uh, I think it is fluff, like Detroit Spartan said, that he's a completely different quarterback. He's not going to march out there and be John Elway. He'll be Rocky Lombardi. Um, like Detroit Spartan says, I'm sure he's improved, but if you're expecting Connor Cook, don't. Okay. And that's the junior version of Connor Cook. The sophomore version of Connor Cook still had some cobwebs as well, correct? But eventually got it straightened out and took him to a Rose Bowl. So you're asking if there's truth to the rumors? I would say no. Don't expect a completely different Rocky Lombardi. Could it be a Rocky Lombardi capable of playing winning football? Sure. Sure. Game management, tuck and run here and there, make some reads, get the ball where it needs to go. Sure. But a guy that on third and 12 can really drive the ball downfield, making three deep reads and finding a good one and consistently delivering that one, I'd have to believe that to see it. But can he keep you out of trouble? get you into a good play, get you out of a bad play, complete the completable passes without being Matthew Stafford. That might be enough to win football games. Might be enough to win three games out of eight, maybe four, if the offensive line is improved, as I expect it will be. If the wide receivers are pretty good, as I expect they will be. If the running backs are pretty good, as I expect they will be. If the defensive backfield is improved, as I expect it will be under Harlan Barnett, if the defensive line becomes somewhat of a pleasant surprise, then yes, merely a game manager and functionality at the quarterback position could help Michigan State go four and four. And you might think four and four, that's no good. Forty four and four is a pretty good record this year for this team, considering all the unknowns, new quarterback. And as I've said a number of times, and I'll continue to say throughout the year, in year number one, Mark D'Antonio went 3-5 and five in the Big Ten. Had a good season, went to the Champs Sports Bowl, played tough with a top 15 Boston College team, led by 
Matt Ryan. That Boston College team was like deep into the top 10 earlier in the year and had a shot at the BCS into November. They were good. And then they lost, fell out of the BCS because they don't have much of a fan following, fell all the way down to the Champ Sports Bowl, one of the lesser bowls. They played a Michigan State team that I think was, what, 6-6, six and 7-5, six, and five, something like that. But that Michigan State team was 3-5 and five in the Big Ten. Beat Notre Dame and was undefeated in the non-conference, so they must have went 7-5. and five. Lost to Boston College, finished 7-6. and six. But they were 3-5 and five in the Big Ten. So, And we all remember D'Antonio's first year as being a pretty good team. Had Michigan beat, then they had the fumble forward. Mike Hart picks it up, and Michigan, to their credit, made a play there, but really was very fortunate to beat Michigan State that year. So 4-4 four and four would be better than D'Antonio's first year. Can Lombardi take them to 4-4? Four and four? Yeah, if all, if all those things I say come to pass. So in terms of losing games this year, you know, you're probably going to lose to Ohio State. Penn State, I assume, is going to be difficult to beat. Although, if I were Penn State, I'd watch out for Indiana this week. I think Indiana's pretty good. Could be pretty good. And we've seen some strange outcomes, especially in Game 1. We saw strange outcomes in the Big 12 in Game 1. Kansas State losing to Arkansas State. Was it Coastal Carolina beat Kansas? Louisiana beat... Iowa State. Iowa State's not lost since. Kansas State's not lost since. Kansas State went out and beat Oklahoma. Then we saw Oklahoma lose to Kansas State. Oklahoma lose to TCU. Oklahoma really uh, almost lost to Texas, which would not have been an upset. Very close to Oklahoma being 1-3. and three. We thought we knew what Oklahoma was. We didn't know what Oklahoma was. Texas is 2-2. Two and two. They had trouble with some, someone else. Who'd they have trouble with? 2-2, two and, two and they could be 1-3. and three. We thought we knew what LSU was, even though they graduated a lot of people. They've gone out and lost to who? Arkansas and Mississippi State. They're going to lose some more. Um, So we think we know what Penn State is. We don't. Indiana, with Penix coming back, got the good running back, got Wap Fillior, wide receiver. They've been making some incremental progress. They went 8-4 last year, and they had Tennessee beat in that bowl game, and onside kick and just blew it. I mean, Indiana came real close to being nine and four last year. They probably should have beaten Penn probably should have beaten Michigan State and went ten and three. Indiana. So anyway, Michigan State. Probably gonna lose to Ohio State. Texas Tech. Thanks, Brad Fashenko. Longhorns almost lost to Texas Tech. So they're two and two. They're lucky they're not one and three. Oklahoma's, I think, two and two. They're lucky they're not one and three. That Oklahoma Texas game last year was like a last week, two weeks ago was like a loser-leave-town match. Maybe not loser-leave-town for Lincoln Riley, of course. He's been in the playoff a couple of times. But the seat's getting a little bit warm for Herman down in Austin. All right. I got off on a tangent here talking about records. Nobody asked about records, but I couldn't help myself. Season starts this week. So Michigan State, you figure probably losing to Ohio State, Penn State, I guess, even though we don't know what Penn State is. Michigan, in 10 days... I'm assuming that's a loss. Uh, Michigan's going to have a good defensive line. The Milton kid has a lot of ability. But if they go up to frosty, cold Minnesota, and if Minnesota's close to what they were last year with the way they could just ball control, they got Hardman back at wide receiver. They're going to miss Tyler, what's his name, the other wide receiver. He was excellent. But Tanner Morgan, game manager plus, right? Strong offensive line. They're losing, who's that pass rusher they had last year? Coughlin, was that his name? Michigan State recruited him a little bit. So I wouldn't expect Minnesota to be as good right away as they were late last year when they upset Penn State, beat Auburn in the bowl game, but they're still going to be pretty good. Can was can Minnesota handle a year of all the pageantry and pats on the back and and temptations of complacency? I don't know, but that's a tough opener for Michigan. Michigan loses that game, and Milton has some troubles. Then they're at home, and they better beat Michigan State. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, Michigan, we don't know what Michigan's, Michigan's going to look like. when Michigan's a, an underdog at Minnesota, but a lot of times when Michigan gets an edge on some of these middleweight teams, like a Michigan State, or a couple years ago, you know, like when they got a hold of Wisconsin two years ago or Iowa, when they roll, sometimes they'll roll 40-7. to seven. You've seen them do that. 
Do they still still have that ability? I have no idea. We think we know what Michigan is. We don't know. Just like we didn't know what Oklahoma was. I mean, is it is there is it a chance Michigan State comes out and looks pretty strong and Lombardi looks pretty good and Michigan State begins the season 2-0? and I doubt it, but we don't know, people. We do not know. It's possible. Records. So you're losing to Ohio State, Penn State maybe, Michigan maybe. At Iowa, I thought Iowa was pretty good last year. Did not play well against Michigan. Looked strong in other games. They were the team that eventually knocked off Minnesota, I think. I don't know. But they went to the bowl game, took care of USC out in San Diego. They graduate Nate Stanley. They've had a lot of internal problems. And you wonder how Iowa's going to deal with that, especially early in the year. Kirk Ferentz is Mr. Poker Face. But things are strange there. They lost their, their strength coach. We think we know what Iowa is, but we don't know. Detroit Spartans says Iowa and Indiana will be tough. Indiana could be tougher than Iowa. Indiana could beat Michigan and Michigan State. I don't know. But the wins you're thinking are Rutgers, Maryland, I guess Northwestern. Beat Northwestern last year. Northwestern had changed it off as a coordinator. They've got a quarterback transfer coming in. Again, everybody over oh, they got they have Peyton Ramsey coming in from Indiana. That's going to help Northwestern. If you play manageable football, win those three. Can you get an upset somewhere else? Is it an upset to beat Iowa? So the three are Maryland, Rutgers, Northwestern. Beat Indiana, and you're four and four. That shouldn't be that hard, should it? Indiana's pretty good. Beat Iowa five and three, beat Michigan six and two. I doubt it, but it's worth watching. We don't know. As far as the defensive backfield, also keep an eye, keep an eye on Christian Jackson. That's another guy that I heard looked good in practice last year. And I've heard some more in preseason camp from some other directions. Christian Jackson, a guy that didn't get on the field. I think he played a little bit against Western Michigan last year. Former three-star recruit out of Marietta, Georgia. Committed to Michigan State over Indiana and Iowa and Pittsburgh. Christian Jackson, um, recruited by Harlan Barnett, didn't do much under Paul Haynes. Now Barnett's back. And D. Penn is in the house. D. Penn. With a nice personal sponsorship. Appreciate that. D. Penn. Helping us out. Ring the bell. Ding, ding, ding. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate that. Appreciate all of the sponsorships so far tonight. Christian Jackson, a guy we've not seen a lot, but yeah, I'll go back to Ron Armstrong. When Mel Tucker was hired, Ron Armstrong said, when a new coach comes to town, there's always that player, maybe one player, maybe two players, that have been beneath the surface, that haven't done anything. A new coach comes in, and the new coaching staff all of a sudden sees something positive that the previous staff did not. We've seen that over the years with several players. And Ron Armstrong predicted that someone like Christian Jackson could be that type of player. He said that back in February because he'd like what Christian Jackson looked like on the field in practice. Well, been hearing from some other avenues that Christian Jackson is indeed playing pretty well. And I would not be shocked, would not be shocked. I think that's a question that comes up later. Yeah, here it is. Question number four, Ryan from Jackson. Who do you think starts at cornerback and at the open safety position next to Xavier Henderson? Well, I'll morph that question into this one. I think Shakur Brown starts because he started at the end of last season, and I think that they're pretty happy with the way he's progressing. And then, I w- you know, you know, Kalen Gervin is in there at the other corner. You know, Dominic Brown, Dominic Long was in there a little bit at the other corner. I expected Davion Williams to get a look. Julian Barnett moved over there. But I would not be shocked if the two starters at corner are Shakur Brown and Christian Jackson. Christian, Chris Jackson. He just goes by Chris Jackson now. He was Christian Jackson when he committed. But that's what I'm hearing about with Christian Jackson. So, Ryan from Jackson, Michigan, who do you think starts at cornerback? I just told you. Um, And that's different from what I would have said two weeks ago. What does that mean for Kalen Gervin? I'm not sure. Um, I'm, 
they they like what he's doing. Probably maybe means he's a dime guy or a nickel guy, but maybe they start a four two five nickel. I don't know. But Kalen Gervin, you know, Barnett was saying he likes his feet and his quickness. Tressel likes all those things. So I think Gervin is still doing okay, but maybe Christian Jackson is doing a little bit better than okay. Really interesting if that turns out to be the case. So he's asking, Ryan Jackson's asking, who starts at the safety position opposite of Xavier Henderson? Now, Xavier Henderson is capable of playing strong safety or free safety. If he plays the free safety, you could see Michael Dowell at the strong safety. If Xavier Henderson plays the free, I'm sorry, if he plays strong, then you could see Trey Person at free. So I think that's competition between Trey Person and Michael Dowell. The Dowell and Person are different types of safeties. Person's a little bit more of a little flyer guy. Dowell's a bigger guy. Henderson can play with either of them. So depending on who wins that battle, Henderson can flip-flop either way. Who am I guessing? Um... I'm going to, you know, I don't think anyone is moving Trey Person out of the starting lineup right now. And, you know, he, he got some, you know, he started at corner a couple for a couple of times as a sophomore two years ago as an emergency starter. It was okay, was functional, had some problems here and there, moved back to safety. He's, he's built like a corner, but he's more of a safety type of player. So, Person... There's an interesting quote from Trestle about Person. Let me find it here. Trestle was talking about Trey Person, and he said, quote, his initial quickness is phenomenal, unquote. Mike Trestle, you know, pats people on the back here and there, but for him to use the word phenomenal, to say Trey Person's initial quickness is phenomenal, and of course, Mike Trestle is coaching the safeties now. Is Person even quicker now because he's a year older and learns it better? Is it because maybe they're teaching it in a, better? I don't know, but his initial quickness is phenomenal, he said. And the rest of the quote from Mike Tressel on Trey Person. Quote, his vision and break when the ball is thrown, those first five steps are as good as it gets, unquote. Mike Tressel on Trey Person. His vision and break when the ball is thrown, those first five steps are as good as it gets. So I think Person's in good shape. To get a starting nod there, I'm guessing it's safety back there with Henderson. And I'm wondering in, if it's Dowell as a fifth defensive back in 4-2-5, or if Dowell comes off the bench in the nickel and they start a third linebacker against Rutgers. Gosh, I don't know, but it sure is fun to talk about it, but I don't know. Let's get these questions going because I'm spending too much time on them. Where am I at? All right, Matt from Grand Rapids. Well, before I get to Matt from Grand Rapids, let's go to Hayden from Lake Odessa. He says, do you think there's a possibility that Michigan cannot play football next week? Talking about the University of Michigan Wolverines. And he says, Jim, go get yourself a drink for all that you're doing. Okay. I'd like to tell you this is quality dairy apple cider, but it's not because I'm all out. But it is a cup that says Dowd's Market, Mackinac Island. The first grocery store in, I don't want to say United States of America because it was open before the United States began. I think that was still French territory, probably. Of course, it wasn't called Dowd's Market back then. Anyway, Dowd's Market. We appreciate Dowd's Market. Not a sponsor, just like it there. Maybe they'll be a sponsor. They don't need sponsorship. But we appreciate our sponsors here tonight. Anyway, Hayden from Lake Odessa, do I think there's a possibility that Michigan can't play football next week? As many of you know, there's like a shutdown in Washtenaw County, and the students at Michigan are told to shut it down, shackle down, shut her down, shutter. Um, the governor in the state of Michigan today issued, quote, she said she's sounding the alarm bell, unquote. No political statements, please. Um, that just is what it is. That's what she's saying. Um, I don't know. You know, five days ago, I would have said, no, no chance. Everything's fine. But, you know, it's gotten cold around the state now. More people are indoors. Fewer windows and doors are open. And 
It appears this thing is more communicable now. I'm not an expert on infectious diseases, but they're sounding the alarm bell. Um, I'm not doubting the numbers. Um, no political statement there at all. But I have to say I'm a little concerned with the way things are heading a little bit, not just in terms of society, but football. If these games could run into, could get thrown on the ropes a little bit, especially with Ann Arbor, what's going on now, especially in the state of Michigan, sounding the alarm, Michigan, Michigan State game next week. You know, theoretically, it would, I mean, it would be easier. I mean, you know, it would be harder if Michigan State were playing, you know, next week against Indiana and Michigan were playing at Wisconsin, you know, for local officials to say no college football in the state of Michigan this weekend, Michigan State, you're not playing. But the Wolverines, you can go play in Wisconsin or vice versa. It might be a little trickier to make a two-pronged ruling on two schools. One might be home, one might be traveling. It might be easier to make that ruling considering they're both playing each other. Michigan, Michigan State, you're both shutting it down this weekend. It would be unpopular with a lot of people, and you you hope that a football decision does not enter into a political decision. I mean, we don't want to get into bread and circus category here, but I don't know. I don't have any of the answers. You're asking me, do I think it's a possibility? Yeah, I guess so, because in the last couple of days, things have gotten a little bit tricky with that. Do I think it's a danger to the players? Not from what I've seen. I mean, I've been saying all along that, you know, they're getting tested, they're getting screened, they're getting red flagged better than probably any area of society, including the armed forces probably. I don't know. I mean, these college athletes are getting tested every day, antigens every day. And when they do get, when there is a positive test, it's flagged immediately and it's hard to get better immediate medical attention than a college football training staff. So, and we've seen the numbers and things, you know, in that age demographic. I think that they're, the, the players themselves are safe. The coaches could get a little tricky. We've talked about that for a long time. The doctors could get a little tricky. We've, we've talked about that for a long time. But the players, no. Would playing football create the possibility of a super spread situation not if there's no one in the stands there's only going to be 500 people in the stands on saturday no band no sparty we'll have two sports writers there from spartmag.com there'll be some other sports writers we will not be allowed out of the press box we're not going to be allowed near the field photographers are allowed in the lower bowl but not on the field the players are safe um so i don't think it's a problem in terms of their health and I don't think it's a problem for a greater society that it could be a super spreader event if there were 40,000 people in the stadium that's a different story so do I think it's a problem that they're playing the football game I mean I don't know but I don't think so I don't think it's a problem for the players and I don't think it's a problem for society is it a problem for them to travel a little bit of a different question I don't have the answers to that but you're asking next week is there a chance that they might not play football well, for the reasons I just mentioned, I don't think it's a big risk to those involved. I don't think it's a risk to the, the the area, unless you factor in they're worried about fans coming in to congregate in East Lansing and party and be a part, be in town for the game. Which there are some people that think that some of the shutdown has to do with that. They don't want for the Michigan Michigan, Michigan State game. They don't want travelers and revelers coming to town which I can appreciate and respect if that's the case. Could they shut it down because they're worried about travelers and revelers passing through town? That's a different question, and that question might have more merit, but I don't know. Boy, I don't know. I'm glad I don't make those decisions. Anyway, Ryan from Jackson got to his question about defensive backs. Matt from Grand Rapids says... Who will have the most yards on Saturday for Michigan State's offense? Who will have the most yards on Saturday for Michigan State's offense? Well, you're not counting the quarterback, I'm guessing. I'm going to say Jaden Reed or Elijah Collins. 
And, you know, Rutgers' defense um, should be the strength of their team. You know, they got some transfers there at the defensive line. I think the 1-4 from Michigan is pretty good. I think Malik Barrow from Ohio State is pretty good. Uh, they return their top five linebackers. The Singleton kid and the Fog kid, I think, are both NFL caliber players. Um, so running the ball against that front seven might be a little harder. So maybe it's going to be Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed having a big debut for the Spartans. I'll go along with that. Detroit Spartans says Naylor Reed or Collins. Jalen Naylor, I'm hearing he's practicing well also. The, the teammates have said a lot of good things about Reed over the years. Um, I'll go with Reed. How's that for a debut? Jay Bannon from Sterling Heights with the tight end question. We already did that question. And Jay Bannon also asks, how many offensive linemen will be part of the rotation for the opening game? Thanks again to Jay Bannon for your generous sponsorship earlier tonight. And he says, how many offensive linemen will be part of the rotation for the opening game? So, I'm not anticipating the type of rotation that Mark Staten was a practitioner of. Sometimes that worked really well, sometimes not so well. Kapilovic didn't rule it out, but I don't get the idea that he wants to establish that from the get-go. I think he might be open to having seven players if they get to that, but I think he's an old school, give me five offensive linemen, these are my set five, let me get them tuned up and oiled up as much as possible. That's what I'm, I'm expecting there. At Colorado, they had a young offensive line, maybe not enough depth, so we didn't really get to see whether he would have done it that way at Oklahoma, at Colorado, or not. So I think they're going to go with the starting five. However, if someone in that starting five falters, Kapilovic, I think, will yank somebody. And he's told these starters that just because you're starting today doesn't mean you're starting for the rest of this practice. That's what Matt Allen told us last night. So there is um, some healthy competition there in the offensive line. They've got some depth. Ten players on the roster have started in the past. Take out Jordan Reed because he opted out. You've got nine. Um, I'm not expecting all nine to play if the game's close. All right, Dan Fernandez says he just signed up for the MAG. Comp, appreciate that, Dan Fernandez. I, I'm sure he took advantage of the new flash sale, which is still available for another hour and 40 minutes as you're watching live. SpartanMag.com, $1 a month. One American dollar per month. $12 for the year. Get signed up. Use promo code. I think it's MSU12. $12. $12. Um, thanks, Dan Fernandez, for becoming a magger. Um, I apologize right now to your significant other because you might be spending a little more screen time than you have in the past. Maybe that's a good thing. Anyway, um, I think Kapilovic is going to go with five. And like Allen says, like Matt Allen said, Matt Allen likes that he's been threatened by the coaches, that you don't have the job forever, and all the players are that way. He likes to be likes to be uh, motivated that way. So I think he wants to go five offensive linemen. If there's anyone falters, you're going to see a hook. I think that's good. I think Kapilovic is the real deal as an offensive line coach. You heard Tucker talk about him yesterday, saying he's one of the best coaches in the country. Jay Johnson said the same thing. A friend of mine's son played at Colorado last year, and he predicted as soon as Tucker got the job here that he would bring Kapilovic with him. Of course, a lot of you know that a friend of mine is Artie Mangum, the father of Jaron Mangum, running back at Colorado. And his son's a tailback at Colorado. Um, I was just reading a text there. Sorry about the pausing there. I'm not sure I got all of that. Anyway, um, sorry I lost my train of thought there. But Kabilovic, real deal. Anyway, oh Jared Artie Mangum, the father of a running back at Colorado. So your your his son is a running back, and he loved that offensive line coach at Colorado, and he was sorry to see him go. Kabilovic, real deal. He's a good recruiter too. So. You know, I so um, also so I, I no, I don't think I don't think there's gonna be rotation. I think it's gonna be our Curry, it's gonna be Allen and Jarvis at right tackle. 
Mark from Cascade Township, Michigan says, who starts at right tackle? I think it's Kevin Jarvis. And he says, who's going to start at the guards or at right guard? Right guard, I've got no idea. I think it's going to be Matt Allen at center, our Curry at left tackle, Jarvis at right tackle. At right guard, you know, Matt Carrick started there last year, 6'5", 320. He's Richard Jr. out of Minerva, Ohio. And he's 12 pounds lighter than he was last year. He played at about 331 last year. Now he's down to 320. Had 11 starts last year. And he was okay. He was functional. Would expect him to be even a tick better now. A little lighter, more experienced. Carrick was functional at right guard last year. So I think Carrick, if, if it's someone other than Carrick, then that means that, that some other person is pretty darn good. I think, I think Carrick is functional. And, you know, Matthew Johnson just pointed out that Luke Campbell played a lot at tackle, too. Luke Campbell uh, started last year at right guard against Michigan, but, um, you know, Seth Foreman says there's no way my, Matt Carrick is 6'5". Interesting intel there from Seth Foreman. I'm not going to argue with Seth Foreman. I've never, I've not actually stood eyeball to chest plate with Matt Carrick, so I don't know if he's 6'5 or not, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. Going out there with a strong statement about something I don't know anything about, so we'll go along with that. Anyway... Luke Campbell, you know, Luke Campbell, you know, has about 26 starts in his career. Luke Campbell was honorable mention all Big Ten as a redshirt freshman. Honorable mention all Big Ten. Was looking good. He's been beset by injuries to the point where he, he needed last year to, like, relight the candle a little bit to get going again. And he was excited about it, but then he had some more injuries. But he started against Michigan, but he didn't finish the year. Now he's lost 15 pounds. He's down to 285. I'm not sure what level of what version of Luke Campbell we're going to see right now. Not questioning his heart at all. I'm just not sure how the parts are holding up. Also, the thing, the things I said about Matt Dotson earlier also pertain to Luke Campbell. You know, he had had an injury. Whether or not he had a procedure at mid-winter, I'm not sure. But any rehabilitation that he was undergoing in March was interrupted. Now you can go home and get some rehab there, but as everybody knows, in March and April and May, there were there was not a lot of that going on at your local wellness center. Okay, so he's lost 15 pounds. I really don't know where Luke pa Luke Campbell stands and all that. I think Carrick is in there. J.D. Duplain started at left guard last year as a true freshman, should be solid. Nick Samak is a guy that the previous staff was high on. Came in and started at center last year when Matt Allen went down with an injury. Samak also read a little bit at offensive tackle last year, then majored in center while Allen was going through his thing. Samak also has repped at tackle during preseason camp this year because they need to manufacture some depth in case of injury because our Curry and Jarvis have history of injuries. Plus, with a COVID situation, you just need to cross-train people to manufacture some depth some, somehow, some way, in case you lose three or four people in a position group. So, Samak has been playing some tackle again. He can play center. Samak can play guard. Maybe he's competing with Duplain at guard. They're not telling us. But there's some people to choose from there. Let's go over to the chat area. I'm delinquent in this. You can charge me with an error, or as George Kell used to say, an error, because I didn't read. I forgot about the chat area. Now I've got some catching up to do. Let's go back to the top. Jacob Terry, i got to turn, put on my readers because I am that old. Jacob Terry says, go green. Great to have him around. Detroit Spartan with applause. Mr. Bowman says the offensive line needs to come out and pound Rutgers and make a statement. Mr. Bowman says, Comp, you have not had that bell in a long time. You're on notice. I talked about that earlier. Hope oh, my microphone doesn't fall. James Bannon, I left a question on the bunker. Got to that one. Spartan 89 says, I see Williams as a hybrid back, similar to some that Ohio State have had. That's interesting because, you know, Anthony Williams was brought in as an R.J. Shelton type of hybrid back. They watched him as a receiver when he was at camp, and they recruited him to be that position. And then I think it was Aaron Young, the running back from out east, that suddenly decommitted, and that opened up a scholarship slot. And Anthony Williams, who was already committed as an R.J. Shelton type, moved from R.J. Shelton-style wide receiver to a running back recruit because Michigan State suddenly didn't have a second running back in that class, and they needed one. 
Who was the running back who decommitted? It was Aaron Young. Where did Aaron Young sign with? Signed with Rutgers. And he will be the number one or number two back for Rutgers on Saturday. His brother played at Rutgers. And it wasn't a huge surprise that he decommitted and went with Rutgers. Interestingly, I won't get into that story. Well, I guess I will now that I mention it. But when he was visiting Michigan State, he, he was at the Michigan State Rutgers game. And I remember Josh Butler got in a little bit of a confrontation with Aaron Young's brother, who's playing for Rutgers. I'm thinking to myself, if I'm Aaron Young and my brother is kind of in a fight with somebody on the other team, I'm like, how does that guy stay committed to Michigan State? I mean, there's no way that he would that he could find himself rooting for Michigan State that day, even though he's a Michigan State commitment at the Michigan State game. And later on he he committed. And I, you know, he didn't say anything about it. There were some rumblings that he might visit Rutgers at some point. But sometimes in recruiting, you just look at the human condition and human human behavior to get an idea of where things are heading. For instance, Ray Sean Benny, the offensive lineman, defensive lineman, he's a two way lineman for Oak Park, top one hundred player, excellent prospect, good offensive line prospect. Very good defensive line prospect. He's probably as good of a defensive tackle prospect as he is as an offensive tackle prospect, but I just think defensive tackles, his type of defensive tackle, have more of an opportunity to have and to disrupt a game and have an impact on a game than an offensive tackle does. I know you need to have a defensive tackle. I'm sorry. You need to have offensive tackles and protections, and those are not real easy to find. But it's easier to find offensive tackles than it is disruptive defensive tackles. You wouldn't know that by looking at Michigan State's roster in the last five years. They've had more disruptive defensive tackles than quality offensive tackles. But by and large, in football circles, it's harder to find game-changing defensive tackles than it is to find offensive tackles. And he's a good offensive tackle. Bends his knees, moves his feet well. Long arms, good use of hands. And when he gets his hands on you, he's strong, whether it's offensive tackle offensive tackle, or a defensive tackle, the way he can cross your face, disengage. And then when he takes off and runs, he runs like an athlete, smooth athlete. Haven't seen him play this year. I'm just going to buy junior film. He hasn't played this year because he had an injury. He's supposed to play this weekend against Clark against Clarkston, though. Clarkston's got some great linemen. It'd be a great matchup to watch. I saw some of the film last year when Oak Park played Clarkston. In the highlights I saw, he never matched up directly with Spindler or Geringer. Was that the other guy's name? Geringer, the guy committed to LSU? Or Spindler committed to LSU? I'm not sure. I forget. But anyway, I need to go over the... I've got the film of the whole game. I need to go over that sometime. Because Benny's a big timer. Anyway, Benny was saying all along he was going to make a decision this Sunday. Meanwhile... He's been doing interviews, including interviews with, with the great Corey Robinson and Justin Thind. Shout out to those guys because Thind and Robinson are doing a great job covering Michigan State recruiting and other things for SpartanMag.com. Really appreciate those guys. They got a podcast called Spartan Spotlight. They had Sean Benny on as a guest. And Sean Benny, you know, very forthcoming, very engaging, talking about the things he likes about, some of the things he likes about Michigan State and the way Mel Tucker talks with him every day or maybe every other day, talks about life, talks about business, talks about life after football. I mean, that's stuff you don't make up when you're really impressed with with a school. But he hasn't met... Well, I, he was at the Ohio State game, I think, last February. So he did meet him briefly. But he's always been considered a Michigan lean all the way all, all along. And then Michigan State's come on strong lately. And he was going to commit on Sunday. And I'm thinking to myself, if he's going to... You know, the, the Michigan leaning thing, that was for real for a long time. But if he's going to make a decision on Sunday, it's not going to be Michigan State. Because if you're going to choose Michigan State, why would you do it human behavior, from a human behavior standpoint? Why would you do it on Sunday? Why not just wait another three weeks and watch Michigan State play some more games, get a better idea of what it's going to look like, and then commit to Michigan State? So as long as he was going to commit on October 25th, I'm like, it's not going to be Michigan State. Just judging by human behavior. Well, and just what makes sense. Well, today he announced that he will not be making a decision on Sunday, as many of you know. He's delayed it and gave no indication when he's going to make a decision, which I think is great news for Michigan State. He wants to watch Michigan State play a little bit. He wants to see what the Mel Tucker thing looks like. He's intrigued by it. He's been impressed with Tucker with the Zoom meetings and other meetings they've had. Impressed with Ron Burton. He just wants to see what the outfit looks like on the field. 
and I don't blame him because that's what a human being would do. The only reason that you would make a decision otherwise is if you're worried about the team moving on and giving your scholarship to someone else, which would not be the case with Michigan State. They'll hold up for Rayshon Benny. He's a big-timer, top 100, and it would be a huge statement if Michigan State were able to reel him in. And if they get off to a good start this season, I think Michigan State will become the favorite. All right, so how do I get talking about that? Oh, human behavior. I was talking about the Aaron Young decommitment. Human being, right? Jacob Terry says, Yo, Kev, you bringing any more New Jersey talent to the Dirty Mitten? I don't know what that means. Kev Wiggs has been working on some dudes. Got to keep pipeline going. Oh, that's Kevin Wigginton. Is that the Michigan State commitment? All right. So Jacob Terry knowing something I don't know about. All right. So Wigginton working on some dudes in New Jersey. I think we had Ty Garland here, who was a New Jersey guy, who's a big-time commitment to Michigan State way back in 1993. So, New Jersey recruiting, representing today, past and present. All right. Rick Nash, Dotson is butterfingers. Rick, that's not nice. Gillison will be the starter. Gillison's got ability. He's got ability. So we're going to see what he's done with his body in the 10 months since we haven't seen him. Always needed to work on his blocking. We'll see how that's come along. Detroit Spartan says, Hunt's not scared to block. To block someone. And he's sneaky athletic. Talking about Jalen Hunt, the defensive tackle. Mr. Bowman says, Comp, how did we get in this position? We used to have very good tight ends. Now we have to find guys to play. You're right. just comes down to recruiting, player evaluation, and development. Dotson was a four-star. It's been it's taking him a while to get going. Injuries last year, you know, some of the other tight ends, gosh, who are some of the other tight I should have looked that up. Some of the other tight ends they've had that haven't. I mean, you know, Seibert comes in, Seibert comes in and transfers in from Buffalo, catches 25 passes. I mean, the door was wide open for him to come in and do some things. Sokol was okay, right? NFL free agent. His hands were not great, you know, but, but you're exactly right. Michigan State. And the previous staff used, oh, Tyler Hunt, Detroit, Detroit Spartans talking about. Yeah, Tyler Hunt, not afraid to block somebody. You, you hear good things about Tyler Hunt. Interesting athlete, former punter, was a holder for field goals last year. Saw him on the kick return team, 16-yard kickoff return against Wake Forest in the bowl game. Was an option quarterback in high school, rushed for about 1,000 yards. Interesting athlete. All conference basketball player. I mean, punters are, you know, punters are pretty rare. There's not a lot of just natural punters roaming the earth, and he's one of them. He averaged like 40 yards a punt as a walk-on third string three years ago. You know, Hartbarger came back last year. Then this year they went out and got the the punter from Australia. So, you know, Tyler Hunt spends quarantine in the weight room. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's a tight end. He's in a program that needs tight ends. So, um, tight end recruiting. You guys, some of you can look it up to see some of the other ones that have fallen through the cracks in recent years. I mean, Gissinger came in as a defensive end, and he's over there. Rosenthal's a walk-on fullback. Gillison's been okay, but you know, a little slow to make a mark, right? Uh, anyway. What else do we have? Call Me Kirk says, checking in. Thanks for the Flash 12 sale. Glad to be a full member. Glad to have Call Me Kirk here. Rick Nash says, Ted Gilmore will have the tight ends ready to go. Great coach. All right. Call Me Kirk says, any truth to what I'm hearing that Rocky's evolved a much better quarterback? All right. We went over that earlier. Mr. Bowman says, who will be the two starting wide receivers and corners? I have not heard much about them. The corners, I think it's going to be Shaq Brown. And I think Christian Jackson. I've been thinking Kalen Gervin, but I've been hearing a lot of Christian Jackson. Um, Julian Barnett moved over to corner. It's taking a little while to gain traction over there. Davon Williams, good athlete, expecting him to make an impact on special teams. Maybe not quite there yet, but I think it's one of those three. Gervin, Jackson, Shaq Brown. Eh, just for bonus points, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to predict Jackson. Nick Harrington says, 
Oh, and as far as the wide receivers, they'll start three receivers, and it'll be Jalen Naylor, Jaden Reed, and Trey Mosley. Nick Harrington says, any real chance someone other than Rocky will get the nod? Like, I get it. It's up in the air. Probably won't know officially until Saturday, but what's your gut thinking? I already mentioned that at the outset of the program. That was question number one. I'm thinking it's going to be Rocky Lombardi. I've heard that he's making the fewest mistakes. But Theo Day, they like his physical stature, arm strength, and talent. Just got to clear his cobwebs a little bit, so they're not going to give up on him at all. And then... Um, you know, I've not, I've heard the least about Peyton Thorne during preseason camp. I'm not sure what that means. Mr. Bowman says, geez, guys, did you guys see that number 17 for Alabama? Lord, is he good? I would kill for someone like him. I don't know who you're talking about, but I think it was either number two or number four that played that slot linebacker position we were talking about earlier, that, you know, that overhang guy, that, that space linebacker that's so key. Alabama, if they ran a 3-4, He'd stand up as an outside linebacker. If they ran a 4-3, he'd be in the slot area as a linebacker. And Alabama runs both, 4-3 and 3-4. And the guy's in the slot area, and he's 6'4", 250. There's, I forget the guy's name. Richardson, maybe. I don't know. But there's just not many cats like that. There's, you, you don't just go out and say, yeah, give me one of those guys. There's like one guy like that. That being said, Alabama's defense is not... So far, what it usually is. Oh, talking about 17. What was his name? Not talk, we're talking about Wadley? Waddle? Or the other guy? Both of them. They, they might be the two best wide receivers in the country this year now that that Clemson guy's sitting out. All right, Nash. Someone assumes it's Rocky. Everyone assumes it's Rocky. Many want Thorn. Some want Day. All right. No real comment there, just an observation, I guess. Steve Bregman says, Hey, Jim, do you think you guys could add dark mode to the Spartan Mag forums? It's a good question. I'll look into that. I've not I've not thought about that. It's a good question. Let's uh, go back here and finish out the mailbag questions at Spartan, from SpartanMag.com. Then I'll come back to the chat area and get through those, hopefully, rapidly. Jim from... Temecula, California. You know, I actually looked this up to see how to pronounce Temecula, 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 California. I actually looked it up and watched a video about the wine regions in Tem Tem Temecula, California to see how they pronounced it. I watched the video. They pronounced it. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought. Not, so I didn't even write phonetically how to pronounce it because I was like, oh, I got it. And then... It, it comes time, and, and I forgot. Temecula, I think. Temecula, California. He says, not the first plan, but... Oh, not the first plan, but um, will they will they go to a, a... Will they go with two quarterbacks? Okay. Um, actually, actually, I just read my answer. His question is, do I get any idea that they're going to be using two quarterbacks, having a two-quarterback system this week or this season? The answer is that's not the first plan. They'd like to have one guy come in, take over, and just ride him. I've not heard anything like, you know, when D'Antonio used to say, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to play two quarterbacks this week or three, but two, or here's Temecula. Thanks, Blong John. He's a Californian. He's helping me out. Temecula. I didn't even write it out phonetically because I thought I had it, and after I looked at it ten times, I finally worked it out. Temecula. I guess I got a Temecula. Anyway, I'm not gonna say it again. Um, appreciate you posting. And uh, but no, that they'd like for everyone to want for one guy to be the guy. Of course, they'd like to have a blowout so you can play two quarterbacks, maybe three. But it's not my understanding that they're planning to go with a two quarterback system. Now there have been times when D'Antonio has done it that way, gone into a game expecting we're gonna give so and so a series at some point in the game. They're not gonna tell us what they're thinking, but I doubt that would be the case at this point. Question number nine, Gator from Novi says, since Luke Campbell is not a projected starter on the offensive line, would they consider him for tight end? Was, wasn't was that his natural position? No, I don't remember Luke Campbell being a tight end. I looked him up, looked it up in high school, and I didn't see him being a tight end. He's 6'5", 285, but no, not tight end. Question number 10 from Mr. 29 out of Royal Oak, Michigan. He says, what are you most excited to see in the first game? Most intrigued to see? Um, 
the quarterback. Want to see who it is, how he operates. If it's Lombardi, has he improved? Does he have a better command of things? If it's Day, can he keep the cobwebs straight? Can he show us some of that physical ability that the coaches are excited about? If it's Peyton Thorne, we finally get to see him in a green-white uniform. Want to see that mobility, the swashbuckling son of a coach, moxie. So the quarterbacks, very intriguing. Also, I want to see, is it a 4-2-5 or is it a 4-3? Is it a 4-2-5 defense from the outset as a base? And if so, who's in the slot area at linebacker? Is it Michael Dowell? Is it Xavier Henderson? Be interested to see. I don't know. Other things I want to see. Matt Dotson, is he able to take the field? If he does, is he good? Is he improved? Because there's still a lot of potential there in him. Is Luke Campbell in the picture? Going back to the previous question. Or is he, you know, just still trying to regain good health? It could be either. You're talking about a former honorable mention all Big Ten as a freshman who seems to be out of the picture. I mean, that's a big variance of a type of player you might get out of someone like Luke Campbell. We haven't heard anything. I assume if he were killing it, someone would have probably mentioned his name. We haven't heard anything. The wide receivers, Jaden Reed, transfer from Western Michigan. We've not seen him yet. What, 55 catches? Freshman All-American at, West, at Western Michigan two seasons ago? He didn't get the special Justin Fields, Shea Patterson immediate eligibility ticket to play right away last year. Could have used him. Didn't get it. So Jaden Reed, Jalen Naylor healthy. He's dropped some weight. A junior now. Physically mature junior. Actually, he's a, he's a redshirt sophomore. He redshirted last year. You know, what does Naylor look like? What do Naylor and Reed look like together? Michigan State's had a great tradition of great wide receivers over the years. Guys that have worked well as, as a tandem. Naylor and Reed have all kinds of ability, but we haven't seen them together. It could be kind of interesting. Trey Mosley, has he improved as a sophomore? We would have to imagine so. Ricky White, does he make an immediate impact? I think a true freshman will make an impact. There will be a true freshman in the rotation at wide receiver, especially now with C.J. Hayes a little banged up. Not sure the extent of C.J. Hayes' injuries, but he missed at least some time in practice. Mel Tucker mentioned some of the young wide receivers. He says he feels good about the wide receiver situation, and he mentioned young receivers. He mentioned Ricky White, Montori Foster, and Lockett. Did not mention Ian Stewart, doesn't mean anything, but he mentioned Montori Foster, one of the more interesting recruits from last year. Big receiver who hadn't played much football in his academic life. Picked it up, played at, I think, Lakewood St. Ed's. He played at one of the big-time private schools in the Cleveland area. Had a great season. Michigan State got on him late on senior film, brought him in, and now he's done enough for Mel Tucker to mention him as someone who's been who's caught his eye. So is Ricky White. So is Lockett. One of those guys is going to be in the rotation. I've said all along I'm expecting Ricky White. I'll stick with it. Other things I'm going to be looking at. Kevin Jarvis, has he improved? We didn't see him last year after the injury. Another guy that was honorable mention all Big Ten as a true freshman. A couple of injured seasons. Now can he stay healthy? He's added some weight, I think. He's at right tackle. New position. Very interesting um, possibilities for Jarvis. He could become an all-Big Ten type of guy, or he could be what he's been the last couple of years. Rooting for him, good kid. The number two running back I'm looking at. We know about Elijah Collins, but will the number two running back be a mediocre type of guy like last year that was kind of inexperienced, or can Anthony Williams Jr. take a step as a second-year player? He's got a lot of ability. You know, is he just a guy, or is he a guy? A lot of variance with some of these guys. Jacob Panishuk, pretty solid last year. Solid player. I think eight career starts. I'm sorry, eight career sacks. More sacks than anybody in the program. Does he remain, you know, a decent pass rusher? Or does he take a next step and become a real factor pass rusher? And once in a while when he gets to the quarterback, he flashes some intriguing hip flexibility and burst. If he's added to that, there's a chance that his ceiling of potential, he could, he, he might not be flatlining as a player. Jalen Hunt, we've not seen him at all at defensive tackle. Um, coaches 
and teammates say good things about him. We've not seen him. Shaq Brown, has he improved under Harlan Barnett? Harlan Barnett's going to have a big impact on all these cornerbacks, all these DBs. They're all going to improve. Who improves the most? Could be Christian Jackson. I don't know. Shaq Brown, he was functional last year as a corner. Does he go from functional to functional plus because he's had six weeks with Harlan Barnett? He wouldn't be the first one to do that. It's happened before. You know, so these are some of the things I'm looking at. Question number 11 from Joe Jarvey. How do you feel about no Sparty? There's not going to be Sparty at the stadium on Saturday. I don't care. Question number 12, Wix Spartan says, Hi, Jim. Have there been any reports about Trayvon Morgan in camp? Wide receiver, big guy. Um, it's been a while since I've been this intrigued by a prospect. He's six foot seven, and you cannot teach six foot seven. That's right. He's the biggest wide receiver I've ever seen, but um, I've not heard anything about Trayvon Morgan. We saw him a little bit in some of the mic'd up clips, but haven't seen him. And for what it's worth, when Mel Tucker mentioned six receivers a couple of days ago, Morgan was not one of them. For what it's worth, and Wix Spartan says, thanks, Jim, first-year subscriber. I love the site and the community. Thanks. Glad to have you part of the community. Sparty from Pauly's Island, South Carolina, says, wondering if you'll be watching the game at the stadium or watching from home like the rest of us. If you are going, just wondering what precautions are being taken, temperature checks, etc. I'm planning to be there. I have to have a mask cover-up, of course. I kind of hope they have the windows open. I like it to be a little bit cold in the press box, wear a coat. Drink some hot chocolate. Maybe sneak a little something in there. Did I say that? Come on, man. What is this, the 1920s? I wouldn't do that. Might make me a better writer, though. But it'd make me sleepy by about 11. And if, you, if you're a Spartan Mag subscriber, you know I'm usually up till 4 in the morning writing stuff and on the message board after a game day. Anyway, um, well, we have to show our credential. There's differences like in the parking lot and stuff like that. I don't want to go into that. Some of that might be secret i'm not sure but um yep planning to be there it's gonna be strange with no one else with with it being so empty it's gonna be real strange be a little bit sad a little bit sad but light at the end of the tunnel we hope question number four hey comp he's i don't i don't know who wrote this i want to give him credit because it's a good post he says he's drinking apple cider with Fireball tonight in the Spartan Cave, and he highly recommends it. Apple Cider and, and Fireball. Apple Cider and Fireball. Let me write that down. I don't have a very good memory. I've got to write that down. I'm a big cider guy for sure, especially quality dairy apple cider. It's thick, and it's not too sweet. They know how to make apple cider with the quality dairy people. Fireball, huh? I've heard about cider and Captain Morgan's. I can't say I've ever bought Fireball. I'm not a big, I don't know. I'm not going to finish that statement. But I'm, I might try that. I might try that sometime. Speaking of cider and Captain Morgan's, don't tell anybody, but me and a friend of mine used to go to a lot of athletic events with him. He moved He's from the thumb. Don't see him anymore. Good dude. Barney, you know who you are if you're out there. Anyway, we went and watched Josh Thornhill one night. It's back when Thornhill was in high school. And I think Eastern was playing Waverly or something. A little bit cold. Barney's like, hey, man, heat up some cider. I got some Captain Morgan's. Put it in a thermos. Not proud of it. Hey, I was 26 years old. But I did go to a high school football game with a thermos. And it had spirits in it. And if I got caught, I would have been expelled. And Thorn, Thornhill played great that night. <laughs> anyway, that's a long time ago. That's another. That's a lifetime ago. All right, what do we got here? All right, the, the 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 fireball guy says, "Hey, my question is, who do you expect to lead the team in sacks this season? It'll be Jacob Panishuk for the reason that just I just mentioned." And he says, uh, after watching the clip of Tucker saying Spartan football is physical and he expects his players to hit. Do you think we might have an opportunity to watch a safety play the position like Kari Willis did? Willis always seemed like he was the hardest 
hitter on the field, and he's doing well for the Colts. I'd say Xavier Henderson has to aspire to that level. He can bring that out. And like I've said before, Trey Person is the pound for pound the hardest hitter on the team. Now, can Trey Person hit like that at his size at about 170 pounds? Can he hit like that, you know, 60 plays a game for th- for nine games for a whole season? Remains to be seen. But I think Trey Person has a little bit of that Travis Key in him. Travis Key was a little dude, but Travis Key was more muscular. Travis Key was a big-time hitter when he had a chance. Uh, Kari Willis, maybe not. I mean, Kari Willis bigger guy, knew the game so well by the time he's a senior, he could anticipate where the ball was going and he could arrive with the leverage and the timing and was outstanding. So that's all we have time for for this for the uh for the mailbag, although Michigan State University did say talk about Pete. That's Michigan State University from Walled Lake. Talking about Pete Secchia, uh, Michigan State University I know he was friends with Pete Secchia. I considered Secchia a friend also. He passed away earlier today. Very sad news. He's been battling. He had been battling health issues for a long time. Last time I saw him was the day Michigan State beat Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game. He tapped me on the shoulder and was talking about some things, and I asked him how he's doing, and he said, oh, you know, not so good. And I never, I never knew him to say that, but he had been battling some health things even back in March, and some new things cropped up this week, last week, it's a sad situation, but what a great life, what an impact, um, like Tom Izzo said, was a big contributor to the state of Michigan, to Grand Rapids, to Michigan State University, to the United States of America, and anyway, good guy, and like I was telling Michigan State University, I was texting with him before, um, Sekia made me want to be, um, I didn't want to disappoint him because he'd singled me out a little bit. Comperoni, what are you doing with that magazine? He'd give me you know, business advice and stuff. You got too many things. Spartan Plus, Spartan Magazine, SpartanMag.com. You need one thing. One thing. I'm like, I know. I'm just trying to. I don't know what I'm doing. But when I'd see him, and I posted this on the bunker, when I, whenever I saw Sekia, I, I, my, my posture would improve a little bit. He's kind of like that demanding uncle a little bit. I'm not saying I knew him as well as an uncle, but when I saw him, I watched my step and I watched my language and things you know and i will say that he would once in a while he'd once or twice he came up behind me and would start speaking italian and i felt bad because i don't speak italian and he's the one guy i've met in life that i was like man i feel like i failed him you know he, he comes up and starts talking italian to me and all i can say is you know with with condinita as much as i can Sorry, sir. I don't. I don't speak it. And I, w- I. I wish I did for him because he. Ex- he was kind of hoping that I did, and he's one guy in life that I've met that I wish I could have made the talk with him that way. Good guy. He was supportive of me, and he was available for um, advice if I ever sought it. And I didn't seek it much. Didn't want to bother him. He's a busy guy. Hard to get a hold of. But I'm gonna miss him. Good Spartan, and I know a lot of you guys knew him too. And I'll miss seeing him around the games, and I know Izzo's going to miss him too. I mean, I, I've been over at the at Breslin. I remember being over there, like, late for some reason, back at the parking lot. I think, you know, me and Kona Dyke, I, you know, somebody left a computer and, we're, you know, whatever, maybe after a Michigan game once, after they lost to Michigan once. And it was, like, hours after the game, like, past midnight. And you can see Izzo's office in there, and you can see who's in Secchia's in there with him, and they're talking. So it's one thing to be around for the parades and the championships, but Secchia was usually around with Izzo also you know, for the tough times. But Sekia, the way he was with me, I think he's like that with Izzo too. He would, he's like that gruff uncle, but he made a mark and we're going to miss him. Let's go back to the, uh, to the, um, the live chat area. We're going to go through this quickly and wrap it up. Mr. Bowman says, Comp, did you hear Pat Chambers quit at Penn State today? Yeah, and I heard that that's, that stems from some, um, racial insensitivity hate to hear that I always kind of liked him and some of his current players stuck up for him on this so I'm not sure what went on there but I thought Penn State did the right thing sticking with him two years ago when they had a tough season with injuries because I thought that they were always close and always close and I'm like they need to stick the course with Chambers because he's he's doing things correctly and then last year, boom, they were good. They were 21-11. and 11. They were going to go to the NCAA tournament. Then the tournament gets canceled, and he doesn't get to play in it. And then this stuff all happened. But, yeah, tough break for Penn State because I think they were just starting to get some traction going. 
Jacob Terry says Ohio Oklahoma State had Chuba, Chuba Hubbard though talking about Chuba Hubbard uh, Oklahoma State against Kansas State last year I'm trying to be funny I think Chuba Hubbard's pretty good Doors fan says excited to see Trayvon Morgan even if only in the red zone this week any word on how he has looked like I said a few minutes ago not sure how he's looked but I agree with you if he gets on the field I'll be like oh man Morgan's on the field and he'll be easy to spot Jacob Terry says you know Kev when you do get on campus talking about um Wigginton again. Terrence Gibson was a great read. Thanks, comp. Thank you to Terrence Gibson talking about the my article that was on there today. SpartanMag.com. Hope to have another one earlier tomorrow morning after this. We're finishing up at about 11. I got to get some work done. I'm going to try to get another story together. It's going to be Thursday already tomorrow. It's almost then tomorrow night. It's uh, pre-snap read of some sort. Going to try to put that together, even though we've gotten zero film on Rutgers. The first game of the year is always difficult for a pre-snap read. Uh, Mr. Bowman says, guys, any of you get a Spartan cut out for the stadium? I did not, in case you're wondering. German Minhas, German Minhas, German Minhas. I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce that. He says, Jim, what's with the tweets and posts on the underground bunker from throughout the middle of the night? Do you not sleep? I don't know. It's a problem. Don, I'm glad. Thank you for your concern. Don Ramiro, the Brez Press, says, I should do what Michael Jackson did to Paul McCartney and trademark the word magger and get the publishing rights to it as if it were a Beatles song. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, uh, Brez Press did come up with the term magger. That was his. He was talking about maggers. We were road tripping to Penn State, I think, when he brought up that name that he, he kind of mentioned maggers. And I kind of adopted it. It's kind of stuck. Some people use it. But yeah, Brez Prez brought up the term maggers. And I'm glad we've got a lot of them. Would like to have more. Cartero917 says, I want to see Noah Kim sometime this season, even if it's in garbage time. I think he's got a lot of potential, and it seems like he's playing great this camp. Yeah, you know, Tucker has mentioned Noah Kim twice in the last week. Um, another little swashbuckler with a quick release. Thin guy, slight guy. You know, anyone could play this year and not lose eligibility so he could get on the field if it's a blowout but if it's a if it is a blowout wouldn't you also like to see Peyton Thorne I don't know but I don't, it's possible I guess hey I'd like to see him too I kind of wish they still had JV teams I'd like to see Noah Kim running the JV team with Trayvon Morgan out there and Brandon Wright at tailback call me Kirk says I chatted last week call me Kirk says I'm fairly new to the chat and have been watching for a while now good to have you here Terrence Gibson says Rico seems to think so. I think you're talking about. I can't remember what that was. I saw that come up live when it happened. Oh, Rico seems to think that Rocky Lombardi has improved drastically. I'm not sure. Detroit Spartan says, I'm sure he's improved. But if you're expecting Connor Cook, don't. Blong John says, I've heard that Thorne is happy with the reps he's getting. Hmm. Blong John knows a lot, too. So when he says something, it's worth pondering. Hmm. Happy with the reps he's getting. So happy to be number two? Happy to be the scout team guy? Probably not. Happy that he's number one? Happy that he's number two. My guess is it's Lombardi. And I, I take that as information because Blong John has some, has some uh, sources. If Thorne's happy with the reps he's getting, I'm guessing that's second string. I'm thinking Lombardi starts because he's a little more, he's, he's, he makes fewer mistakes, like I've said. Experience, all that stuff. Day, I think, is number three. A very talented number three because that goes along with the Mel Tucker, mic'd up, motivation Monday, focus on the future, not the past, the hand slapping thing. They like Day's ability. They want to keep him, keep his pillows fluffed. Process driven, motivation Monday. But son, this week you're number three, and we we need you to be a, a, an engaged number three and go run the scout team and prove us wrong. Reading the hieroglyphics and the, the tea leaves. That's my guess. Lombardi one, Thorn two, and a talented but foggy Theo Day three. That's my guess. Peyton Fletmeyer, 6'7", receiver. He definitely needs to get some reps. He needs to stay healthy. If he stays healthy, um, 
it, at some point, he's got to make an impact, I would think. Good to hear from d Pend again. The sponsorship. Nick Harrington says, also, what about Morgan, a wide receiver? Huge guy. Heard crazy athletic. Any chance he breaks into the top four or three? He's got to stay healthy. He was injured as a junior in high school. And he was injured last year. Had a great senior year. Became a four-star recruit. Detroit Spartan says, Chris Jackson has decent size for a corner as well. I think he's six feet. Six feet. Peyton Fleetmeyer, Fleetmeyer says, Nick, yeah, he definitely needs to be playing, laughing out loud. Red zone deep ball threats. Detroit Spartan says, Trey Person gets mentioned often and is not afraid to hit somebody. Pound for pound, the best hitter on the team, I say. Austin Courier says, go green. The rest of you can say, go white. I'm not going to say go white. Not my style. Nothing against it. I'm just, I'm not a... I'm a member of the media. There's no cheering in the press box. Detroit Spartan says Naylor Reed and Collins as the starting wide receivers. Seth Foreman says go white. Dan Fernandez just signed up. Oh, Naylor Reed and Collins for the most yards on Saturday. Got it. Brad Fashinko says you won't regret it, Dan. Thanks, Brad, for the endorsement. Fashenko says, any recruiting updates on the younger Mangum? That's Jaden Mangum. Um, wide receiver, about 6'3". Birmingham Groves had a great catch last week against Oak Park. I've been playing some phone tag. On that one, nothing new at this point. Played some phone tag on that today, as a matter of fact. Nothing new, though. Buckets for Life says, I just talked to Noah Kim, and he just told me he might start. Buckets for Life, being a wise guy, I think, but we appreciate that. Matthew Johnson says, Luke Campbell played a lot of tackle, too. He did, played some guard and tackle. 26 career starts. What do we have here? I just lost my place. Think We got a lot of comments here tonight, a lot of them. We might... I might run out of juice here with my phone, with my camera. So if all, if this thing ends abruptly, thank you to everybody that participated. Thank you for everybody for playing. Those of you that did not win, we will give you some lovely parting gifts. Thanks for playing. So if the battery goes out, I'm going to keep reading these. Been going for too long. Appreciate, uh, I'm sorry for keeping you here this long, but it's game week, right? We're having a good time. Lost my place. Here it is. Cartero 19. Will Devontae Dobbs get some good playing time? I think he's got a ton of potential. Dobbs did not play well last year when he started against Rutgers. And I've not heard a lot of great... I've not heard anything bad about him during fall camp. I've not heard anything about him. Well, I'll take that back. I have heard from people outside of the program with sources that not really expecting him to uh, be in the mix at this, not at this juncture, not at this juncture to channel Dana Carvey there a little bit. Might not have made the most of the quarantine time. And Dobbs at some point is going to need to show that his wick is lit and that he loves football and he's all in. Tyler Miller says, don't forget to add Brown as well, Cartero, to get some playing time as well. Brown. I don't know who that would be. I'm not good with, like, just, like, a last name, especially if it's a common last name. When you say Brown, oh, Spencer Brown. Okay. Yeah, you know, you know, we heard earlier during camp that he was a surprise, a pleasant surprise at offensive tackle, so that's good news for him. And he's got a lot of ability, and he does have a lot of want to, so his... Slope of improvement will continue to escalate. Good future for Spencer Brown, it sounds like. What happened to the former recruit Blackshear at Rutgers? As someone said, he uh, transferred to Virginia Tech. Michigan State did recruit him. Michigan State liked him, and at some point it looked like Michigan State had a chance to get him, and then kind of pumped the brakes, slow played him, and he ends up going to Rutgers. Had an impact, transferred to Virginia Tech. Talking to some people that cover Rutgers, they say they that he was decent, but they're probably not going to miss him a lot because they've got Pacheco, a running back that did a little bit of damage against Michigan State last year, although Rutgers was shut out. And then you've got Aaron Young coming in as the number two running back. And at some point, there'll be times when Aaron Young becomes the feature back within a certain game. So they think they're okay without 
black shirt. But that's easy to say. Then you get someone banged up, and then you start missing him. Seth Foreman says, does Benny want to play offense or defense? He wants to play defense, according to the depth, depth chart that... Uh, the depth chart, the podcast that Justin Finn and Corey Robinson put out a week and a half ago. Great interview with with Benny and uh, a guy that's like in his situation right now. Peyton Fleemeyer says, does Sparty have a chance getting Rayshon Benny? I'm saying, yeah, a chance. I would have had Michigan State at 35% earlier today if he were deciding on Sunday for the reasons I mentioned earlier. It just didn't make human sense for him to choose Michigan State right now because if he's leaning to Michigan State might as well wait watch Michigan State play and just feel better about it unless Michigan State said like I said hey take the scholarship offer now or we're moving on and they're not going to do that Michigan State is going to wait for Benny so when he announced today that he's no longer committing on Sunday and it's still pretty much open my confidence meter for Michigan State went from 35%. And 35 was lower than anyone else. And that was a very conservative 35. I, would, I was raining on people's parade by saying 35. And I started to post that earlier today. And right around the time when I was going to post it was when the time the, the news came that he had announced that he's not going to decide on Sunday. And right then, instantly, my confidence meter for Michigan State went from 35 to 50 not quite as it didn't grow as much as the Grinch's heart grew when little girl who from Whoville gave her the flower or whatever it was and it grew five you know not quite that much but a lot and teetering toward 51 so we'll see what happens here in subsequent weeks but yeah that was big and it has everything to do with Michigan State Peyton Flaymeyer says if Sparty beats Michigan I think we're getting him if if they beat Mich- if Spartans if Sparty beats Michigan on the football field probably right and he, even if they don't if other things look good it's gonna be solid that's gonna be an interesting recruiting chase good player good player um Tyler said that's good news for Benny to get him to see us play first assuming that Michigan State's gonna look you know functional good impressive. You don't want to go out and lose to Rutgers 28-7. to That's going to hurt your chances, right? Everybody knows that. But time is on Michigan State's side here. The longer it goes right now, the better. I might not be saying that if he doesn't commit, if he does not sign in December and we get to February, you don't want to be leading that long and get in the friend zone, which I think Michigan was in the friend zone with him. All right. Jack Camper was a tight end, if I remember. James Bannon says, that's true. Yeah, Jack Camper was a tight end. Came in as a tight end, moved to defensive end. Um, They still need him at defensive end. He's been riddled by injuries. Didn't stick at tight end for whatever reason, but you're exactly right. Earlier when I was trying to think of tight end recruits that they've had that haven't panned out, Jack Camper would be one because in some of those recruiting classes, they had room for maybe one tight end every other year. He was one of them, didn't work out. Hence the room for Cyber to come in last year. Noah Davis was a tight end the recruit. Thanks, Doors fan. Noah Davis played as a true freshman, good blocker, hurt his knee, missed like his sophomore year, and then boom, transferred out. Did he transfer to Cincinnati, I think? That's a good one. Good blocker. If Camper and Davis, you know, had panned out, then you don't have a tight end problem. But that's what happens. When you have back to back attrition at the same position, and Camper wasn't really attrition, just didn't pan out, could be a pretty good player at another position. So it's not really a washout but your tight end evaluation didn't come through. And Camper, Michigan State recruited him as a tight end based on what he looked like as a tight end in high school in Virginia Beach. And then he transferred to IMG down in Florida. They moved him to defensive end. I'm not sure even, and he was kind of okay at defensive end, but Michigan State recruited him and signed him as a tight end, having not seen him play tight end in 24 months. So that was kind of a strange evaluation. Matt Sokol was a high school quarterback. Another strange evaluation, kind of. You're kind of, kind of stretching things there a little bit. So thank you. Yeah, Camper and Noah, Noah Davis were the tight ends. Can Hayward play tight end or H-back? H-back, yes. Tight end, he would be short for tight end. You need long arms to block at tight end. So H-back, motion back, yes. I think you might see that. Peyton Fleetmeyer says, Hampton Fay, a dog, went to Alito High School with him. A smart, confident, low-key, kind of cocky, but overall a great kid and player. Thanks, Peyton. 
good information. I got. I didn't check to see how Faye's team did this weekend. I know they lost two weeks ago. Rob South says, who's your guy's sleeper for this year? A guy nobody's really talking about, but you expect big things from. Mine is Drew Beasley. I think he's going to have a great year. Everyone knows I'm a Connor Hayward guy, too. Dark horse guy. Sleeper. Christian Jackson. Um, does Jalen Hunt count? Drew Beasley's, you know, that's a good one. Added 20 pounds, functional in the past, bigger now, starting. I think he can be functional. I don't know if he's a loud guy. Detroit Spartans is Jalen Hunt. Jalen Hunt's a good one. Uh, Blong John says, Montori has B.J. Cunningham ability. Give him a year. That's a big statement. Montori fought B.J. Cunningham's all-time leading receiver at Michigan State, I think. Detroit Spartan deals glass bottle apple cider. Glass bottle apple cider. Excuse me. Sounds like we got an apple cider snob on our hands. As we should. I'm all about it. Deals Orchard Cider Mill on a dirt road just outside of Milford, Michigan, between Milford and Holly. Got some good apples there. Deals Orchard. Doors Fan 91. Tom Usick passed away today. I didn't know that. Big timer from, was he for the 60s championship team or the early 50s? I should know that. He was a captain. Darn it. I completely crapped the bet on that one. On a day like this, he deserves more than that for sure. Bear with me here. I can't find it. Can't find it. Anyway. I wanted to do that one justice and I, I blew it. I've read about him a lot but didn't commit it to memory. Anyway, I'll have to move on. Give me an F. Show was going pretty good until I screwed that one up. Some thoughts about Pecky or uh, Pete Secchia also. Detroit Spartan can confirm that I don't sleep. I am a vampire. Matthew Johnson says, do you think Hampton Fake could contend for a starting job next year? I think it's possible. If he uh if Michigan State does not get great work out of quarterback this year. Comes in at mid-year. I think he has a chance to maybe come in at mid-year. True freshmen are starting at quarterback more readily than uh, they do than it used to be in recent years. I wouldn't predict it, but I wouldn't rule it out. Nick Harrington says, any news about Irvin Jr.? Nothing new. Cedric Irvin Jr. down in Florida. Michigan State recruiting him hard. He's a 2023 kid. All right, hey, comp. Favorite song by 42 Doug. Justin Thin making a joke there. Justin Thin was talking about 42 Doug with uh, Rayshon Benny and Davion Prim during their podcast. So they're talking that they like 42 Doug, guy from Detroit, rapper. So I had to go on YouTube and look it up. And I was introduced to my first two or three 42 Doug songs. I watched one, and I watched another, and I watched another. I rewound a few of them. Because I, I appreciated the videography because there's a lot of a lot of fast moving scenes from around Detroit and it seemed very organic and um, um, a lot of information there. Um, he's got something to say. An urban poet of sorts. You said quarterback of the 50s Rose Bowl. Um. But anyway, 42 Doug, young guy. Um, the language I'm not comfortable with, but that's that's his poetry. That's fine. I mean, I understand it. But, you know, I think back to like when I was young and like, you know, 
rocking out with the guys and the girls and have a good time. Usually, you know, you you have some refreshments and you're rocking and you're you're saying the lyrics and you're or whatever the song is. Some of those lyrics I can't say. I don't feel comfortable. I don't know how you rock out to that because some of those words I don't want to say, but I understand it. So it was good and I I thought it was it had a different cadence than some of the hip hop I hear today. Some of the hip hop today it all sounds the same and I don't I don't like how it's all it's kind of overproduced, and I didn't feel this was overproduced. I thought that it was a little bit more throwback to maybe older style rap. Not that I'm a rap aficionado or anything, but anyway, that's what I thought about 42 Doug. <laughs> if you want my point of view. Anyway, Justin Thin says 42 Doug is new this year, so you're not too far behind Detroit Spartan. Yeah, he looks young. And I think in one of his songs, 42 Doug said that he didn't that he that he dropped out of school. So he might still be high school age. I don't know. Um, but, uh, it was, it was, it was solid. Nick Harrington says, what types of things at halfback or H-back or whatever can we expect from Connor Hayward? I think similar to what we saw in the past, they used to motion him out as a receiver because he's got wide receiver ability. He's got to show as a ball carrier that, that he can follow the play and have vision and he's got to be enough of a threat as a running back so that the opponent, if they see him on the field, they don't know 90% sure it's a pass because then it kind of hurts unless he's completely a third down back like Preston Pearson, dating myself. Third down Preston, the initial, the, the original third down back. Justin Thin, that different cadence is Detroit Raps sound these days. That's why it's different than the rest. Great. I'm glad to hear that. It's And... It's not completely old school, but it's but it's different than than what I because some of the stuff that I hear, I'm like, man, that's okay. But then, wow, it sounds like all the other forty songs that I hear on the occasion that I might partake or look into it. But um, and it's not necessarily their fault. It's record companies saying this is what works. You're doing it. This is what works. You're doing it too. This is working. You're doing it too. I'm guessing that's the way it works. But this, it had a little bit more, like I said, organic. And I, I didn't. I don't feel like it was unpolished. I felt like that's the the finished product they wanted. And I thought it's. And I, like I said, it's not my thing, but I I understood a lot of it. All right. Justin says Detroit Comp says Comp will break down anything. <laughs> I will. I'll break down apple cider. I'll break down hippity hop. <laughs> Hippity hop. Wait, wh- who was it? Was it uh, who called it hippity hop? Kyrie, right? That's who it was, right? Okay. All right. Justin Thin says next week you need to break down Ted Grizzly and Sada Baby Comp. It's what the people need. Write that down. Write that down. Two weeks ago we broke down Eddie Van Halen and Jimi Hendrix. And by the way, I was listening to. The Channel 27 on uh, Sirius Satellite, the Van Halen tribute station, and I forgot how much I liked some of those songs. I hadn't listened to Van Halen a lot, and like, and you know, some of the some of the cheesy Van Hagar I hadn't listened to in 25 years. And I'm not saying it's the best music in the world, but I forgot how much I used to like it. it used to be workout songs back then, but the old Van Halen. I was like in seventh grade when Van Halen. Came